If you have your Bibles with you today, we are in Hebrews chapter 5, and we'll start at chapter 5, verse 11, and go through uh, chapter 6, verse 3, as we continue on through the book of Hebrews that we have been studying this fall. And uh, the book of Hebrews is written, we don't know who wrote it, but it's written to uh, a group of Hebrew Jewish Christians uh, who were living in a tough time. It was not easy being a Jewish Christian at that time where they were. And they were in danger of, of drifting away, of going back. And so it is a book that has quite a few warnings in. There are five major warnings in the book of Hebrews. And, uh, you know, we, sometimes we don't realize how many warnings are in Scripture. The, the sanitized, the domesticated Christian faith says we never have, need any warnings. We've got it made. We've got our ticket to heaven. We believe. There's no need for warnings. Yet... The New Testament is full of warnings. The Apostle Paul has many warnings. Peter has warnings. Uh, 1 Corinthians is a book of warnings. Hebrews is a book of warnings. Uh, such as in chapter 2, verse 1, the writer of Hebrews says, For this reason we must pay, must pay closer attention to what we have heard, so that we do not drift away. He says in 3.12, Take care, brethren that there's not be in you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. This is the New Testament Christians that they're speaking to. Take care, brethren, that there not be an evil, unbelieving heart in any of you falling away from the living God. He goes on to say there, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts like they did back in the desert. Uh, you see, the problem is we can be deceived. And we can have a believing mind and an unbelieving heart. So Paul says in several different places, you should do this unless your faith was in vain. In other words, if it wasn't real. So th there's some challenges there that we need to take hold of in this Christian faith that sometimes we feel just so warm and secure like we just don't do anything but glide down the river of salvation to our final destination with our ticket to heaven in our back pocket so we'll be allowed in no matter what. The Bible has some strong warnings, and Hebrews has many of them. So why all this concern? Well, it is revealed in chapter 5, verses 11 and following. In verse 10 in chapter 5, he, well, he's 9 and 10, he's talking about Jesus' high priesthood, and what he has done for our sins, and what a great Savior we have, and what that means in our lives. And it says, uh, Having been made perfect, verse 9, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, having been designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Now, this Melchizedek, that's an interesting thing. We'll be hitting that in another couple weeks as we go on in Hebrews. But verse 11, concerning him, we have much to say, but it is hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Literally, the Greek word, you have become lazy, sluggish. For by this time you ought to be teachers. You have need again for someone to teach you the elementary principles of the oracles of God. You have come to need milk and not solid food. For everyone who partakes of milk is not accustomed to the word of righteousness, for he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good from evil. So this is why he's given him these warnings. Because he's looking at a group of believers that by now should be teachers, but they are still in need of being spoon-fed the ABCs. They're not growing. They're not growing. That's the problem. Lack of growth. They should be moving on. They should be teaching. They're still needing to go back to kindergarten and learn the ABCs. They're needing milk and not solid food. Paul says something very similar in 1 Corinthians 3, chapter 1. He says, brethren, I could not speak to you as spiritual men, but to men of flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink, not solid food, for you are not able to receive it. Indeed, even now you're not able, for you are still fleshly. Since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly? Are you not walking like mere men? The very same thing Paul says there. You should be growing, and you're not. So this is one of the challenges. For us, Christianity means growing. 
The very definition of what Christianity is means to be growing. It's not a ticket to heaven you get when you say a prayer and put in your back pocket. It's the beginning of a life of growth that will continue until you are glorified in his very presence by the power and working of the Holy Spirit. It's like that trip I talked about from New York to California. That's the Christian life. Salvation isn't the arrival, it's the beginning. And we are to keep going, which means keep growing. No one stays the same who is truly in the kingdom of God. No one stays the same who has been touched by Jesus Christ. No one stays the same who has the Holy Spirit living within him. It's an impossibility. Do you understand that? You should not be staying the same. No matter where you are, no matter how far you've come, you should not be staying the same. Today, you should not be staying the same. You should be in the process of growth. I should be able to take a microphone and pass it around in these pews to everybody and say, here's the question, what's God doing in your life right now? And we should get story after story after story of exciting, sometimes difficult things that are happening, but God is working. What sins is he working on with you right now? If you were asked that question, what would you say? What sins are you and God, by his Holy Spirit, working on in your life right now? If you say, well, I don't know. That means one of two things. Either you're per perfect already, or something's not right. I could tell you the ones he's working on with me. You don't want to hear them, but I could tell you. I hope you could, too. Because that means he is working, and he works patiently and powerfully. But it is all about growth. We've been in the First Thessalonians in our Thursday night Bible studies, and chapter 4 is where we were last week, and it's kind of interesting what he says in chapter 4. He, gives a, he tells us exactly what the Christian life is about. He starts out in verse 1 saying, Finally then, brethren, we request and exhort you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us instruction on how you ought to walk, in other words, live, and please God, just as you are actually doing, that you excel still more. He says, okay, I, first of all, I want to exhort you, request and exhort you, that just as you received instruction on how, what it means to live as a Christian, and you're doing it, by the way, but excel, here's my exhortation, excel still more. Doing it's not enough? No, because Christian life is growth, by definition. Excel still more. Down to verse 10 of the same chapter of 1 Thessalonians, starting with verse 9. Now as to the love of the brethren, you have no need for anyone to write you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. Indeed, you do practice it towards the brethren who are in all Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, to excel still more. Why would he be saying that to a group of people that don't need to hear it? They're loving the brethren. But he says, that's great. Now, excel still more. Because the Christian life is a life of growth by the power of the Holy Spirit, if indeed it is genuine. So, brothers and sisters, you're doing great. Excel still more. The problem with these Hebrews is they were not excelling still more. They were stuck back in, in that beginning point. 1 Peter 2.2 2 says, like newborn babes, long for the pure milk of the word so that you may grow in respect to salvation, because that's the goal of it. Uh, so, but what about the mature? What does it mean to be mature then? Well, we go down to verse 14 in this passage. He said, but solid food is for the mature who, because of practice, have their senses trained to discern good and evil. Because of practice, they have their senses trained. They have learned what is right and what is wrong by practicing it. The Christian life, friends, is not something just to be believed. It's something to be lived, something to be done. We don't, we don't just believe Christianity. We do it. We live it. If it is genuine, it is a life that is lived. Yes, it's based on our beliefs. That's important. But we do not stop there. We do it. Uh, Ephesians 4, 14 and 15 tell us that we are to grow up into Christ and to, to build the body up in love by the proper working of each individual part. 
In other words, as we are doing what God has called us and empowered us and gifted to do, that's how the body grows in love. When each one is doing what God chose them and called them and empowered them to do, that's a real life thing. It's not just what they believe. It's what they are doing, which is really the work of God in us. That's how we build each other up in love. Tell them you're busy now. (laughs) That's how we build each other up in love, by doing what God wants. If we see our brothers and sisters living out what God called them and gifted them to do, that is going to be a praise to his glory. It's going to be easy to love them. It's going to be hard to start finding reasons to disagree with them and not like them for petty little things. When we see Christ working in one another, it glorifies him. It says the mature by practicing have learned what that means. Titus 2.10 says to adorn the doctrine of God our Savior in every respect. You know what that means? To wear it. Wear the doctrine of God in every respect. Not just know it. Right, right after that, the next verse is where he talks about the grace of God has appeared. We're supposed to wear what we believe. Christian theology is not to know so that you know who's right and who's wrong and who across the church there is wrong about this issue and who over there is wrong about that issue. It's to be worn. It's to be lived. It's to be exercised. And he says in the exercise of that, that is where you grow and you move on from the ABCs. So, and when when we aren't doing that, what is there? There is strife and jealousy, as he said in 1 Corinthians 3. There is wrangling over words, which he talks about in many of his other letters, to avoid those who like to wrangle over words. So we are called to grow. We are called to put into practice what we know. It's not uh, a doctrine to be believed as much as it is a life to be lived, and that is the problem with these Christians he's writing to in this book of Hebrews, why he has all these warnings for them. Now, what's the solution? We go to chapter 6. He says, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about Christ, let us press on to maturity. So he says, okay, let's leave that stuff. Let's leave those ABCs. Let's press on to maturity. That's the same word Paul uses in Philippians when he says, forgetting what lies behind, reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That I have as my ambition to serve him, to live it out. My life direction is to serve him. But what's interesting in chapter 6 in these first few verses is, he says what some of these ABCs are. Let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and faith toward God. Say, Folks, let's not have to be born again again and born again again and again and again. Let's, not, let's get off of that rut of having to come back to the same basic things once again. Let's move on from that. That's done. Jesus took care of that on the cross. That's what we celebrate in this bread and this cup. It's finished. It's over. Sin has been defeated. If he's in your life, you are victorious there. But the call is to move on from that. What does that mean for your life? It says, of instructions about washings. It's really important who's right about baptism, isn't it? Well, it can be, but no, it's not. What's important is loving and serving and following and obeying Jesus. Some of your brothers and sisters that disagree with you on things like the right mode of baptism, may be greater servants of the Lord than you. Are you looking down on them because you're right and they're wrong? Let's move on from that stuff. On the laying on of hands, spiritual gifts. Let's, let's get off fighting over those kind of things. Serve God with your gifts. You don't know what your gift is? You don't need to take a class in spiritual gifts that goes through them all and has a survey that says, fill this out, and you'll find out what your gift is. That's not going to tell you anything. You want to know what your gift is? Serve him. Commit your life to serving him and obeying where he leads you and what he does, and you cannot help exercise your spiritual gift because it's found in him directing you in his service. He will not lead you somewhere where you're not gifted. You want to find that sweet spot? Serve him. You'll find it. You may have a few doors closed. You'll learn from that. He'll take you there. 
The problem with us not understanding what our gifts are is not that we haven't had a class in it. It's that we're not practicing it. We're not practicing our faith. We're not doing anything to speak of. So how are we going to find out what we're supposed to be doing? To know him, to serve him, obey him. Of the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. Don't worry about the end times, the details, all that stuff. Serve him now. Sometimes people get so hung up on the end times and all their charts and revelation when's gonna, and the Antichrist and they start figuring out and looking at current events and it's so fascinating and they've got it figured out. He's coming soon. So they start building their extra storage house so they can stock all their food there for when the difficult time comes. When the whole time, if you're really serving Jesus and you see the end times is near, you're not going to build a bigger barn and store up food for yourselves. You're going to spend every single minute you have pleading with everyone you know that doesn't know Jesus. Be reconciled to God. That's what the call of God is to serve him. That is not self-serving. Get off that stuff and serve him. Forget about this fascination with all these theological details as important as they can be if false doctrine is infecting the church. But get off of those things and start living your life for him right where you live with your friends and neighbors and live Jesus Christ before them. Praying for them, seeking him every day, getting your instructions from him through his word, through prayer. It's a living relationship. He says, let's leave the ABCs. Let's press on to maturity. Like those who through practice have their senses trained to discern right from wrong. That's the call to the sleepy believers who are not growing. And this is why there are so many warnings there. And I love the way he ends the section we're looking at now. Verse 3 says, This we will do if God permits. Isn't that interesting? This we will do if God permits. He finishes up by saying, it's not our doing, it's his. This isn't a call for Christians to start sucking it up and doing more. It's a call for Christians to start seeking the Lord Jesus Christ, pressing into him and let him direct your life and live his life through you. It's his life that has lived in us if it is truly the Christian life. And if Christ is in you, you will hear this message, and you will respond. If Christ is in you, you'll hear this message, and it will call you to respond. And the message he also warns again, if you hear it today, don't harden your hearts like they did in the desert. If not, if you don't hear this message, well, we'll talk about that next week when we go on in Hebrews chapter 6. This morning, we're going to conclude by going back to this table, which is that point that we go to regularly. This is a reminder. This is a preaching the gospel to ourselves. This isn't just going back to the ABCs. This is, this is leveling the table at the foot of the cross and saying, brothers and sisters, we're all at the same level here. We are all unworthy, yet we are saved by grace because God loved us so much that he gave his life and shed his blood. It's a reminder of his great love for us. It's a reminder that we were bought with a price. It's a reminder that we are not ours. We are his. And our life is to be lived with him living within us. We're called to examine ourselves as we come to this table. Not to see if we're worthy to take it, but because that's the thing we do when we come into the presence of the Lord. We, when we examine ourselves, we ask him to search our hearts, knowing that we are already forgiven because of what he did on that cross. It's, it's not there to lower us. It's there to exalt him so that he might be glorified in us. Let's take a moment. Just bow in your hearts and ask the Lord to search your heart and show you how much you're in need of his grace this morning.